All right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Uh, you're welcome to the service today. This is the King's Court Zion Ascent service. And today, by the grace of the Lord, we're going to go through an interactive quiz uh, based on lessons we've heard in the last few weeks. But let's start off with prayers. Father, we give you praise. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading us through those sessions of prayers today. What an awesome time in your presence. Just allowing the word of God and the spirit of God guide and direct our prayers, direct our focus, direct even the direction of the prayers. It's such a beautiful place to be at, it's such a beautiful thing to be a part of. And we thank you for the vessel that you use, Lord, to lead us, to lead the charge in, in, in those prayers. And thank you for that awesome time of worship as well. Yes, there's this place, the presence of our Father. is a place we love to be, where we worship, bow before you, reverence you, and come into this transcendent glory of yours, the glory that transcends everything else. Is our prayer that your church worldwide, your church universal, will begin to focus on these things, turn our attention to them, and begin to see and access the gateways, the portals that you have opened unto us. Because he who said come certainly has made a way for us to come. If he's inviting us to come up here, it is because access is being given. It is now, the question is now whether those invited will take the time to really hearken and respond to the invitation. Here in this house, we do respond, oh Father. And so Holy Spirit, we continue to yield to your leadership, continue to yield to your guidance, continue to yield to your influence. Yes, reveal to us sounds of heaven, give us hearing ears. Reveal to us visions of God, give us seen eyes. And then in turn, give us utterance to declare what heaven is declaring, that we'll be in sync with you all the time. That's our prayer. We bless the service today as we go into the squeeze. Thank you for the blessing it brings forth. Uh, we know, Holy Spirit, a dimension of your, of your uh, uh, function is to remind us of things. So this squeeze is set to remind us of things that have been taught already. So we trust that the Holy Spirit will be blessed by it. And for that, we say amen. Amen and amen. All right, we're going to move on quickly. And uh, so again, is the interactive quiz. I had to catch the, <laughs> the clicker. <laughs> Just so our audience like, what was that? <laughs> is the clicker, nothing more. <laughs> amen and amen. So interactive quiz. Now this interactive quiz will cover lessons from the Acts of the Holy Spirit series. We have two series going on right now. One of them is called Acts of the Holy Spirit. And then the other one is called State of the Nation's Prayers. So this quiz is going to cover the sessions we've done. We've done two sessions on both. So we're talking about four different lessons altogether. All right. So here's number one. So take out your, your writing materials and write, uh, and then evaluate yourself at the end of, uh, the, serve, at the, end of uh, the quiz. <clears throat> so number one says, in our State of the Nation's Prayers, going back to that series, part one, Prayers for the nations was founded upon a biblical text. There was a text we read, and we said that is the foundation for our praying for the nations. So if anybody was to say, oh, we don't have to pray for nations, we can say, no, there is a biblical text that actually shows we should pray for nations. And I'm emphasizing this because there are some sects, denominations, individuals who think that way. I have been in a church where we were taught not to be bothered about the world at all not to even pray for the world. We've, I've been taught that. So there are people who are still in such places who wonder, should we really be praying for the nations? Well, we have a scriptural text that proves that. And that's why I'm asking this question, because you need to know. If you encounter such people, what are you going to say to them? What scripture are you going to point to that shows that you ought to pray for nations or that we at least should be concerned about what happens in nations? So this scriptural text declares God's house shall be a house of prayer for the nations. Where is that text found? A, Isaiah 56 and verse 7. B, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. C, Revelation 2020. <laughs> and D, none of the above. So make your note, make your um, pick your option and then let's see what we have and you can evaluate at the end of the day it's Isaiah 56 and verse 7 
Isaiah 56, 7, it says, even them, I will bring, I'm talking about the foreigners. It's important to read the entire context. But in verse 7, it says, even them, speaking of the foreigners, will I bring to my holy mountain. And we did say the holy mountain is a realm in God, which traces all the way back to Hebrews 12. You have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to an innumerable company of angels and all of that. That's the holy mountain of God. And he says he will make them joyful in his house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted. Of course, in our case, we're not bringing bulls and goats and rams. The Bible says our offering is what? The sacrifice of praise, you know, our lips, our worship, and our prayers. Because we're told in Revelation that the prayers of the saints came up as a sweet, as an incense. And this angel picked it up, mixed it up with the one going on in heaven and then cast it into the earth. So there's a marriage between the prayers of the saints coming from the earth plus the sounds of heaven. Are you seeing that now? Coming together and God throws them down into the earth to cause things to happen in the earth. So it says those offerings will be accepted on his altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. However you want to interpret this, it still brings you to prayer, <laughs> okay? So even if you want to say, okay, every nation praying, well, that's fine. So the house of God is made up of people from every nation. But then he wants them to also be people of prayer for their nations or for every nation. So the house of God ought to be a place of prayer. And then the Lord Jesus quoted the same text. So he is the final authority. Because some people might say, oh, that's Old Testament. It doesn't apply to us. Yeah, I'm deliberately doing it this way. Okay, well, this is the Lord Jesus repeating or quoting the same text from Isaiah, saying, is it not written? This is Mark 11, verse 17. Is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? Yeah, but you have turned it. So it is you who turned it. But what I want it to be is a house of prayer for all nations. All right. Number two, in the Acts of the Holy Spirit series, the next series, what do we mean by the phrase acts of the Holy Spirit? Because some people may hear that and say, we've never heard that before. What we know is acts of the apostles. <laughs> and we've already clarified that here. Now, the Holy Spirit did not inspire the, 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 uh, the theme or the title of the book. It is men who did that. Question is, are they right? Well, is that truly correct? We have come to see in this house that we cannot say it's acts of the apostles for various reasons. It is actually acts of the Holy Spirit. So when we say acts of the Holy Spirit, what do we mean by that phrase? Hey, what we're saying is that the Holy Spirit is an actor. You know, in the days of Hollywood, everybody's actor. <laughs> so maybe the Holy Spirit too is an actor. B, when we say that, we mean actions and words inspired by the Holy Spirit. C, when we say that, we mean drama created by the Holy Spirit when he falls on folks in church, like shaking and screaming and running around the auditorium and all the stuff people do that they call the Holy Spirit. So it, it, maybe those are what we mean by act of the Holy Spirit. And then D, all of the above put together. So make your answers and let's see what we have. Oh, B. So what we mean when we say acts of the Holy Spirit is we're talking about actions and words inspired by the Holy Spirit. And there are plenty of them in scripture following the arrival of the Holy Spirit. All right, number three, as we study closely the actions and words inspired by the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, we see that, pick your answer, A, the Holy Spirit was in charge of operations. B, the Holy Spirit was the highlight of the book. C, these acts and actions or words and actions are guidelines for modern day believers. And D, all of the above. The so pick your answer. And D is highlighted. So it's all of the above. So as you study these acts of the Holy Spirit, which is why we, we decided to call the book Acts of the Holy Spirit, you're going to find out that they highlight the Holy Spirit as the one in charge, is the one who determined things, is the one who gave guidance, is the one who gave instructions for things, gave commandments. He is a commander indeed. 
you know, and, and if that is the case, then we can do differently. We can pursue something else. So modern day believers ought to follow the same as a guide. All right, number four. In our State of the Nation's Prayers, part two, this was just last Wednesday, we focused on a recurring instruction regarding prayers for the nations, an instruction we found that kept coming again and again. So what is that instruction? A, to pray always. B, to stand in the gap. C, to watch and pray. And then D, to, to, to carry out protests against unfavorable government policies. Okay, pick your choice. And let's see the answer we have. C, to watch and pray. That instruction kept coming again and again to watch and pray. We see a, uh, there's a, they go hand in hand. Watching and praying go hand in hand. <clears throat> All right, number five. Now, in the case of number five, it's going to be coming from you. There's no option. I'm not giving A, B, or C because it's a number of things and you can go any direction. So list for us uh, the reasons that we're given why we should watch. <clears throat> As you can remember, I'm going to give you a few seconds to do write what you can. Uh, if you just only make the topic, you don't have to write the whole sentence. So many reasons we're given why we should watch. Some of them are, you list them. And the reason we're doing this is, again, people don't see, oftentimes we skip that watch part. Pray, pray, pray. A lot of people talk about prayer, but watch, people don't talk much about watch. And I think that because we're not following the instruction completely, we're missing a lot of things. We're not watching. To watch and, and entails a lot of things. So those were why Jesus told us to watch. What are those reasons? I, I take it you've written some, but again, you can update and add to what you have. So here, yeah, it's, it's quite a few, so I should have split the, uh, the, the, the slide, but let me try to read from here. So first one, so you can observe. As you watch, what you do, you observe. If you're not watching, you can be observant. Like somebody said, you become ignorant of what you ignore. If you ignore, you become ignorant, but if you watch, you observe. And then your observation will now determine what you do. But the next thing is that so our prayers can be relevant. You can have something happening around you and then you're praying something else. There's an adage from my, my people, my tribe would say, you know, somebody whose house is on fire, that's not the time to chase a mice or a mouse, okay? I know mouse is a problem. You have mouse, you want to kill mouse, but the house is on fire. That's not the time to chase a mouse. <laughs> mouse is a smaller problem compared to the fire that is on the house. So priorities will be set right if you're watching. That's what it means. You won't be engaged in something that does, that's not even relevant to what's going on. So your prayers will be relevant, but it will also be timely. Because a lot of times, uh, even the Holy Spirit warns us of things, we don't take it lightly, we don't take it seriously until it happens. It's, ah, the Holy Spirit told me, but it's too late now. But if you're observant and watching, your prayers can be timely. You can pray and be a few steps ahead of the enemy. Because when you observe, you can see the movement of the serpent. You know where he's going. So you block him before he gets there. And then your prayers will be spirit inspired. Because as you pray, I mean, as you observe and watch and observe, you will have to lean on the Holy Spirit. How do we handle this? What do we do about this? And he will inspire. Next, why should we watch? So, uh, so that we can complete divine assignments. How does that apply? Nehemiah. Nehemiah was given a, a mandate by God to, to do a, a work that, you know, both uh, blesses his people and, and maintains, the, you know, their longevity so they are not erased from the face of the earth. But then enemies came against him. So enemies will come even when you do the will of God. Even when you do something good, you will have enemies. Now, Nehemiah watched and saw what was going on and then set up an army of people working and praying and putting up their shield in case the enemy is releasing weapons. And so the work was done, the Bible told us. So the work was finished in record time. So he watched, he observed, he prayed, and he took action. So sometimes God may give us an assignment to accomplish, but because we're not observant, we're not watching, you find out that the enemy is able to block us 
and we're not able to complete the assignment God gave us. But when we watch, we can know and see what's going on and then take adequate measures to ensure we finish the work. What next? Why should we watch so we do not fall into temptation? Jesus told us that. Watch and pray so at least you fall into temptation. So watching prevents us from falling into temptation. What else? So we don't miss divine timing. Watch and pray because you do not know what time it's going to be. Even though he was speaking about the coming, his coming, but that applies to everything that God does. We don't want to be taken by surprise and we don't want to miss God's timing. Why do we watch? So that we are counted worthy to escape. We just read that, Luke 21, 36. He said, watch therefore and pray always so you are counted worthy to escape all these things that will come on the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. Why do we watch? So we're not ensnared. He said, these things that will happen will come as a snare upon those who dwell in the earth. So you watch, you avoid booby traps. You watch, you discern, you don't fall into snares of the enemy. Some things that will come upon the world will be snares. There will be traps. And God wants your eyes to be open so you don't fall into traps. That's why we watch. Why else do we watch? So our hearts will not be weighed down. Because when things take you by surprise and come at you on all sides, just the overwhelming impact can cause your heart to be weighed down. But if you have been warned by God and you've been following events and you've been observant, you're going to find out that your heart will not be weighed and nothing will take you by surprise. You're like, okay, I saw that coming. I saw it coming and I was ready for it. Why else do we watch? So we're not taken by surprise. I already said that. Why else do we watch? So that our flesh will not remain weak. Jesus said the, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Now, actually, here's something the Holy Spirit pointed out to me regarding that text this morning. When Jesus said the flesh is weak, but the spirit, or the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The word weak there is the opposite of willing. So if he says the spirit is willing, then what he's saying is the flesh is what? Unwilling, correct. That's right. So if you are expecting your flesh to be willing to engage in prayers, to be willing to do the will of God, it's not going to happen. So the flesh actually needs reasons to become willing. That's why you watch. <laughs> because I don't know anybody who sees danger coming close and still says, it's time to go to sleep. No, you won't. Your spirit man sees beyond time. Your spirit man can pick up signals in the spirit, but your flesh hasn't seen it yet. It hasn't occurred to your flesh that there's a matter, this is a matter of urgency. Your flesh still thinks it's time to play. Your flesh still thinks it's time to eat and wine and dine. Danger is ahead of you, but your flesh says, eh, it ain't that deep, it ain't that serious. But when your flesh sees it, oh, okay, it'll wake up. Now it's willing. So Jesus said, when you watch, you will now find reasons for your flesh to become willing to join your spirit. That's why you watch. Why else do we watch? So we can obtain a special recognition before the Lord. Now, saints, for those who are watching us or listening to this, this is important. This is the Lord Jesus, Luke 21, 36. He said, watch therefore and pray always so that you may be counted worthy to escape these things and to stand before the Son of Man. So there are some deliverances that will come as escapes, not as victory. <laughs> I know you are an overcomer. I know, you, I know you fight demons and principalities, but Jesus says some victories will be escapes. Will be escapes. So if God is showing you, like the prayers we're praying today, can you imagine folks in Afghanistan so because you are a Christian, an apostle or whatever, bishop overall, or prophet, <laughs> prophet penultimate, whatever you call yourself, you think you can change Afghanistan situation right now? So if God is showing you a way of escape out of Afghanistan, you say, no, Lord, I'm taking charge here. <laughs> I am taking charge. Afghanistan, you come on that. Now you will be the one who is foolish. In fact, you're taking charge is rather too late because often what I found out is God warns ahead of time, ahead of time for God's people. In fact, Job 36 talks about it. He said, God speaks to man once, twice. They don't hear it. Then it comes in a dream, hoping to wake them up in their dream, to terrify them. 
so that when they wake up, they begin to seek somebody who understands dreams, who can explain what the Lord is saying. But don't forget, the dream is not the first. The first is he spoke once, he spoke twice. You missed all of that. So when danger is at the door, that's not the time to begin to take charge. In fact, if the enemy is already knocking at your door, it means you didn't wake up when God said to wake up. So you have missed a few steps. So now to begin to say, take charge, you're wasting your time. It's escape you need now. Escape. And many God will begin to show ways of escape, but because their flesh gets in the way or because they are not watching, they will not see the way of escape God is making for them. Can you imagine if it's your family member in Afghanistan? And they're calling you and telling you, sister, brother, whatever, I'm trapped. You know, these folks are going from door to door. I don't know when they will come to our, our street or whatever. Then you understand the urgency of what I'm talking about. Will you be telling him pray and fast then? You know, call heaven's armies then to protect. No, escape, get out. Jesus did the same. Picked up stones to stone him. The Bible said he just escaped from their midst. And even Paul tells us, that with the temptation, God will show what? A way of escape. So we know that's scriptural. All right, let's move on. All right, so number six, in our Acts of the Holy Spirit, part two, what can knowledge of the Acts of the Holy Spirit do for us? When you know the Acts of the Holy Spirit, what will that do for us in our time today? A, it will order our spiritual vocabulary. <clears throat> B, it will expand our spiritual discernment. C, it will elevate our expectations either in personal or corporate spiritual engagement. For instance, prayers, worship, Bible reading, and teaching. D, all of the above. So make your peek and let's see what we have. D, all of the above. When you know the acts of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit inspires, what he inspires, and so on and so forth, it will change your vocabulary. So when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, you don't say something is telling me. You know it's not something. You know it's the Holy Spirit. So your vocabulary changes. The Holy Spirit is saying to me. And you'll be bold saying it because you know it's the Holy Spirit. It doesn't make you any more sanctimonious, holier, than anybody else because you say something. In fact, it makes you ignorant when you say that. Because if you say something told me to do and you did, but you don't know what the something is, what kind of a person are you? <laughs> so when they say, who told you to do that? They say, something told me. And preachers say that thinking it's an, it gives an air of superiority. No, it doesn't, it's ignorant. If it's the Holy Spirit, says the Holy Spirit. And watch this. If you're not sure it's the Holy Spirit, then why do you want to make any move? Why don't you wait until you confirm that it is the Holy Spirit? Right? You have to confirm first it's the Holy Spirit before you make any move. So that's how God moves me. I just heard it and I'm going. No. <laughs> don't just go because you heard it. You have to know the acts of the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit inspire words and actions? What is the expected outcome? They won't leave you in the dark. We give you guidance. You will know, and you can trace it back to scripture. And then you can boldly say, oh, this is the Holy Spirit speaking to me, all right? So the other one, expand your spiritual discernment. So that way you will know if, if it's not in line with what the Holy Spirit did in scriptures, you can question it. It's okay, wait a minute, this thought's coming to me. This word I'm hearing, this picture I'm seeing, this dream I had, this prophecy somebody gave me, that word that was preached by somebody, this book I'm reading, this music I'm watching, this movie, all of everything. You can begin to challenge, discern, is this of God? Where is this coming from? Can this be the Holy Spirit? But then also it elevates your expectation. So if I see what the Holy Spirit did in, in the book of Acts, I can expect the same. If it's not happening in my life, I can say, okay, but Lord, you did it in the book of Acts. I'm raising my expectation. You don't stay at religious level where they say, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be world without end. No, Holy Spirit, you did change things here. I want this. It elevates your expectation. It also puts you in a place, if you're praying, for instance, you expect the Holy Spirit to actually respond. 
you expect the Holy Spirit to actually move. Do you know it is by that that you can boldly lay hands on the sick? What's the point in laying hands if there's no expectation? God help us. <laughs> Number seven, in our Acts of the Holy Spirit part two, we mentioned, four, I didn't want to say this earlier on because I knew the question was there. We mentioned four sources of information revealed in the Bible. You're going to list them, write them in your paper. What are they? And the reason I went into that was because when people say something, what do you mean something? Something has to fall within these four categories because the Bible reveals four sources of information. It's either coming from one, two, three, or four. So you can't be saying something. Put that something in one of the categories where it truly belongs. You see, so you, you, you're not creating a fifth source. It falls within those four categories. And I'm asking you to list them. All right, so here we have, <clears throat> the first one is what? The God realm. The God realm. And when we say God, we, use, we chose the phrase God realm because it's not only God who speaks from that realm. And these are things believers need to understand. That's why you can't be saying God said, God said, God said all the time. Because even though the word is coming from the realm of God, it may not be God speaking to you. You see that? Because don't you know Jesus can speak to you? Don't you know the Holy Spirit can speak to you? Don't you know angels can speak to you? So when you say God said, God said, God said, okay, you, you're modeling things up. We have to know, is it an angel speaking to you? Is it the whole, in fact, in most cases, is going to be the Holy Spirit. Because that's what Jesus told us. He said, he will take from me and will reveal to you. He will guide you into all truths. He is with you and he shall be in you, what? Forever. So the Holy Spirit is going to be the one doing the guiding. And how does he guide? He speaks by, he guides you by speaking to you. He's going to take from Jesus and will reveal to you. He will illuminate scriptures. He will guide you into all truth. So he will reveal things to you. So most times when believers say God said, it is actually the Holy Spirit speaking to them. Actually the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean God doesn't speak. God can speak to a person, but most times it's the Holy Spirit. And then if you have an angelic visitation, you, you know it's an angelic visitation. Cornelius. The angel appeared and said, send men to Joppa and look for one called Simon, and he will tell you what to do. Now, if you now hear Cornelius saying, God told me, okay, you know something is wrong because it was an angel who told you that. So that's why we use the phrase God realm, the realm of God, and that you'll find in Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. You have come to where? Mount Zion, the what? City. Are you seeing that? It's a realm. It's a city. It's not just... <laughs> One person is a whole city. And what do you see there? An innumerable company of angels. What else? Jesus, the first begotten of the Father. And even you have the firstborn, the church of the firstborn. And you also have the souls of just men who have been perfected. All of that is in the God realm. We don't want to explore these things. That's the problem. We don't like exploring stuff. We want receive in Jesus' name. <laughs> My money is coming. Money in the bank or is it money in the mail? Checks in the mail. That's what we love. We don't want to explore the revelations of God's word. which we, I, I, And you know something that the Holy Spirit showed me this morning, Romans 12. And I think I put it in here. We are being renewed. It says, do not be conformed to this world. But what? Be renewed. How? By the renewal of your mind. Now, it's not just renewal in any direction. Where is it going to lead you to? To prove what is good, acceptable, and what? Perfect will of God. So what will God do for us? Help us renew our minds to understand better what is acceptable to him and what is his perfect will for us. How will he do that? He brings revelation. He brings truth. He brings insight. He brings inspiration. Now, if you don't receive that, your mind is not being renewed. You're going to be conformed to the world. That's where the church is at. We're conformed to the world. We're not receiving the fresh manner of fresh truth coming from heaven's realm. Well, not, that's not the only realm that speaks. There's also the satanic realm. 
the satanic realm speaks too. You know, Job, the Lord God asked him, where are you going? Where are you coming from? So, what kind of question is that? I'm going back and forth the earth, you know, just roaming the earth, but not just roaming for roaming sake, observing humans, observing humans. And that's why God asked him the next question, what have you discovered by observing? And his response is telling, humans will give, for, give anything for their lives. Humans are, you know, self-preserving beings. Humans are self-preserving organisms. They preserve themselves. So if once it's a life-threatening situation, humans can give up anything. That's what Satan discovered. So once Satan, so Satan and Father, that's why Hebrews 2 tells us those who were held subject by what? Fear of death. See that? Fear of death. Satan has learned that lesson. And I'm saying that for us to know. So Satan has learned from the days of Job that once human life is threatened, they can give up anything. So if you want to know whether a man truly believes in something or truly can hold on to something, threaten them with their lives. And so a lot of people have been threatened. And once they see their lives are threatened, they're even ready to give up Jesus. Like Simon, remember that? Remember Simon? Yeah, denied Christ three times. Denied three times. Now, it's not just Simon, it's humans in general. So just know that's what the enemy is going to present before you. Threat, threat, threat to your life, threat to your source, threat to your uh, uh, prestige, you know, if you have one, it threatens those things because he believes if he does, that will make you give up anything, including your allegiance to God. May that not be our portion in Jesus' name. So Satan speaks too. The, the realm of Satan speaks because you have demons, you have principalities, you have powers, you have rulers of the darkness of this world, you have spiritual wickedness in high places. All of that is in the realm of Satan. Okay? Gates of Hades. But then there's also creation realm. Creation realm speak. Creation speaks. Psalm 19. I didn't think about this when I spoke on that. Psalm 19. It said, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows forth his handwork. Day to day utters speech. Night to night declares knowledge. There is no voice or speech or language where their voice is not heard. So creation has a voice of its own. Just by observing creation, people can come up with things. Like people looking up and seeing the sun and, you know, in their imagination say, wow, this is a powerful uh, thing. And so began to worship it. Are you seeing that? It wasn't Satan who told them to do that. It was their own uh, observation and conclusion based on creation. But then the individual realm also is there. Humans have a voice of their own too. People can, you know, when people say, you know, I, I, I decided to do it, you know, my thoughts an imagination came to my mind. It's not always that that is Satan or God. It can just be the human being himself. So when you say something spoke to me, it's got to fall within those four realms. And I would say do a little bit of research and investigation to know which one it is. All right, number eight, list some of the acts of the Holy Spirit that you remember. So if somebody were to ask you, do you know any acts of the Holy Spirit? What would you say? You all are talking about acts of the Holy Spirit. What are the acts of the Holy Spirit? What would you say? List them. Write them down. What are the acts of the Holy Spirit that you know or we've talked about that you remember? Acts of the Holy Spirit. All right. Here's what we have. We have sounds of heaven. And all this you find in Acts 2 alone. Acts chapter 2 have all, have all of, uh, you know, has all of this listed. So there came a sound from heaven. Sounds of heaven. So the Holy Spirit communicates the sounds of heaven. But also it shows us the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So the Holy Spirit does give utterance. And, and to use a modern term, we call it what? Inspired vocal expressions. Vocal expressions that are inspired by the Holy Spirit. And don't you think we need that today? Oh, yes, we do. There's so much craziness in the world today. I mean, people who have been to the best schools and everything, when they open their mouths, you'd be like, Oof. it's like, where's that? Where is that coming from? You mean all that degree you got, this is what you, this is all you can produce? This is all you can say? And 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 child of God, think about it. Isn't it interesting when you sit back, 
you know, remove yourself from the whole situation and just observe. You begin to see how that when the Bible talks about, you know, spirits that rule people, you know, spirits that tend towards mind control, spirits that make people do things that ordinarily they shouldn't do. It makes you begin to see and say, wow, this is interesting. People coming up with concepts, ideas, somebody makes a phrase somewhere and before you know it, it catches on like wildfire, becomes a national theme. Everybody's using the same phrase. And you're like, wait a minute, did, did somebody send an email or text message? <laughs> send some text message at 2 a.m. for everybody to use this word today? How is it that this phrase, we didn't hear it yesterday, but today is all over the news. It's like, when, how did I miss the memo? <laughs> Phrases are coming up. Concepts are being released into the world. You know them. We don't even need to go into them. And then people who are supposed to be experts are giving them, you know, wings to fly, lending their position and their influence to ideologies and themes that you can't even source. You don't know where they came from. And you can't even prove in many cases. But they've taken on like wildfire. What else would the Holy Spirit inspire? Visions of God. Visions of God. <clears throat> visions of God. The Holy Spirit inspires visions of God. And anybody who's questioning that, I think the prophecy in Joel takes care of that. Your young men shall see visions. That's prophecy. End of story. Your young men shall see visions. So if you said that, then expect it. It should be because of the pouring, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. All right, number nine, complete the statements for us. <laughs> so the, the blank should have something there. And I, I wanted to see if you remember to complete it. So we said divine operations follow dash. <laughs> I didn't think anyone was going to get this, but let me know if you get it at the end. And then the next one is operations of the spirit reveal dash. <laughs> so, so write what you think should be in those uh, spaces. Divine operations follow something. I'll, I'll give you a clue that both of them are the same. It's the same, it's the same word or phrase in both of them. Divine operations follow dash and operations of the spirit reveal that same thing. All right, here we go. Divine patterns. Divine patterns. Isn't it interesting that when God does things, he reveals a pattern? This is how you know. The Bible says no one is his counselor, right? Because no one came before him. So when he does something, you cannot say he's imitating somebody. <laughs> As I know, this just made me understand it. You cannot say, okay, God is doing it like, no. When he does something, he releases a new pattern, which becomes the way to do that thing. And sons of God need to follow that, which is why as a child of God, as a son of God, as a daughter of God, you cannot be borrowing from the world. You see that? What steal from Satan? Because God doesn't borrow from Satan. God doesn't borrow from the world. He is always first. He is what? Alpha. So as Alpha, he lays the patterns for us. So as his sons, when we look at the acts or the operations of God, study the patterns, study what he's doing. That's how we can tell from Genesis 1, verse 2 and 3, the spirit moves. Then the word goes forth. The spirit moves, then the word goes forth. Because the spirit bears the word. It's called the spirit of truth. And his word is truth. So we know that. We know that. I mean, there are many. I can give you some more. Remember the days of uh, David when they were supposed to bring the ark of God back from the house of uh, Obedidon. You know, David in his, uh, I don't know, flamboyance as king and all that, went and created his own thing, created his own pattern, brought a new cart, you know, oxen nobody has ridden on before and all of that and all of that. And so, okay, and then set dancing and trumpeting and every, perfumes everywhere. It was a right, I mean, it was party in, in Jerusalem. <laughs> but before they could go 
you know, too far, somebody died in the process. And David's like, ha, God, what, what's going on? We're trying to celebrate you here. Why is somebody dying in the process? And that was when the elders now said, oh, 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 we missed something. <laughs> the ark is supposed to be carried on the shoulders of the priests, not on a cart. So because the Philistines put it on a cart doesn't mean you should do the same thing. Do you get that? Because the Philistines didn't know what to do with it. So they put it on a cart, you know, their own imagination say, you know, let's bring a new cart nobody has used before, oxen nobody has used before, and put the, uh, you know, the boars and images of the boars that they, they had on it, and the mice that came in their land, they made images of that and put on there, and then let, let it go. And the power of God drove that, drove that cart to the house of Obedidon, finally, right? So you, as a priest of God, you cannot borrow from Philistines. You don't go and borrow from the Philistines. You ask the Lord, okay, Lord, how is it? But then he's already revealed how it should be done. You just didn't go to search. A lot of things we do today, we borrow from the world. We borrow from, and don't forget, First John, I think, chapter 5 tells us, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So in essence, when you're borrowing from the world, <laughs> you're subject to the wicked one. We've got to take templates, patterns. Isn't that what he told Moses? See to it that you build according to what? The pattern that was revealed to you. God reveals patterns. Church of Jesus Christ, sons of God, daughters of God, stop borrowing patterns from the world. Stop borrowing patterns from the enemy. Seek the Lord for his own patterns. So divine operations follow divine patterns. Operations of the spirit reveal. I'll give you one more. Spirit. So here is uh, the, the disciples. When they came out of Jerusalem, don't forget when they came out of Jerusalem, they came out in a hurry because they were being persecuted, right? So they, they literally ran for their lives. But as they traveled or as they, they, they ran from Jerusalem, the Bible said they began to preach to people. But then they preached only to Gentiles. I mean, only to Jews. They preached only to the Jews until Romans, I mean, Acts 9 happened. Simon, remember the story, saw the vision, visions of God. See why, why we need visions of God. Vision of God came to him. He saw unclean animals. Rise, Simon, kill and eat. He said, no, I've never done that all my life. Don't call what God has called clean, unclean. And then when he woke up, he didn't know what the dream meant. And then he heard voices and the Holy Spirit said, go with them and don't ask no questions. Simon got there and was still following the pattern of the Jews. Our father, these are not Jews, so why are you telling them about your fathers? They don't need to hear that. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Cornelius is a Gentile. He don't need to hear your father's stories. He just, needs, he just needs to know what God wants to do. But Peter went back. Our fathers left Egypt. That, that, that. The Holy Spirit said, you're wasting my time. And came on them while he yet spoke. Why he yet spoke. So Simon said, oh, okay, if they are filled with the spirit, who stops us from baptizing them then? And so he baptized them. When he came back to the Jews, the Jews came against him. Simon, we heard you went to the house of Cornelius. Why did you go there? Don't you know you were a Jew? Don't you know? He said, guys, chill. The Holy Spirit moved and that revealed the pattern to me. And the Bible said, from that day, they began to preach to Gentiles, not only Jews. Patterns. So if that had not happened, oh, today we'll be saying salvation is only for the Jews. That's what we'll be saying today. But the Holy Spirit broke that. Say no, it's not only for the Jews. This thing is poured out to everyone. Like we just saw in Isaiah 56. Even them will I accept in my holy mountain. Who? Sons of the foreigners. So those of you who are still claiming Jews, 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 you're wrong in that. Because God is the God of the whole world. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. All right. The last one, number 10. Why do you think, this is to us now, why do you think the Holy Spirit is illuminating these lessons to us at this point in time? Because this is the crux of the matter. This, this, is, this, this is the critical point. This is the issue. This is, this is it. This is the goal. Why do you think so? Because I promise you, I am not the most anointed. We are not the most anointed people. Okay, my wife does a lot of prayers. I can tell you, I can give that testimony. Not me, not so much. I can tell you that. 
my wife prays a lot, but I can tell you even at that, we are not the most praying people on planet earth. You already have seen our church. You've seen where we are at. You cannot say this greatest church on planet earth. I know of people who fast almost every day of the year, except for a few days. We know some of them, right? We know of people who, I mean, they move in mighty signs and wonders. They, they are gifted. We know they have it. Not the ones who, who do mago mago, <laughs> who do fake miracles. Real anointed folks, we know. But why is God revealing these things to us at this point in time? You got to ask yourself that. You got to think about that. I know people who fast and pray to receive a message from the Lord. I'll give you a story. One day we were invited by a family friend. They are also ministers to their church. And, uh, you know, when we got there, I think I preached or so. And then Prophet Deborah gave a, a, a prophetic word. And when she gave the prophetic word, the, the man broke down and said, what? So I've been fasting for two weeks. And what I was fasting for, you just revealed in that prophetic word. Did she fast? No, she did not. We didn't even know <laughs> we were going to answer somebody's prayer. It's been praying for, for two weeks. So it's not that we fast to get it. I know people who will fast before they even see insight into the word of God. Some people are amazed at Prophet Deborah. They're like, what? I see you moving all over the place. You go to the stores, you buy, especially when we have conferences. She's all over the place. And I, I'm watching you pick somebody up from the airport, take them to their hotel, change the hotel room because he didn't like it. It wasn't good enough. Did all of that. Went and got them food to eat. And it was almost time for conference. And then you stand here and preach like you've been in the mountain of the Lord for 40 days. And they are amazed, like, how? I'm really saying of God, it's true. It is very true. Some people, that's where, so you've got to know it is not about you. It's the grace of God. And if it's the grace of God, you should ask yourself, why? What's he doing it for? Because there's a reason. God is a God of purpose. God is not like Father Christmas who gives things without no relationship, no purpose. No, when God does things, there's a purpose behind it. So what is the purpose? What is God trying to do? I know you have some, but here's what we have. Number one, I think it is because we as humans on planet Earth have entered another shift in times and seasons. I think so. I think 2020 was the year the world changed. <laughs> 2020 was the year the world changed. We've gone into another time and shift and into another shift in time and season. But I also think it is because we are being equipped for this time and season. Because the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ said, you know, uh, uh, um, he will not allow you to be tempted with that which you cannot bear. Paul said that. But with the temptation, we'll make it well of escape so you can bear it. So the Holy Spirit equips, prepares even before the situation comes. So I think God is preparing us for days ahead. And you should know that. And don't take it lightly. I also think it's because, so we can upgrade and update our knowledge base. Because don't forget, knowledge is power. Jesus Christ criticized the Pharisees. He said, you have hidden, you have taken the key of knowledge, locked it and threw it away so that these folks cannot receive knowledge. So knowledge is key. And a lot of churches don't preach knowledge. You're just preaching sentiments and emotion and, you know, things that make people happy for the moment. But knowledge grounds you. Knowledge, Paul said, for we know, not we think, not we feel, not we wish. We know. When you know something, it puts you in a different position altogether. So God wants us to upgrade our knowledge base. I also think it's because he doesn't want us to be taken by surprise. Don't be taken by surprise by the enemy. So God is equipping us by that or by anything happening around us. But also so our utterances will be guided. So watch what you say. Be inspired by the Holy Spirit. I personally have withdrawn from much of Facebook talk these days. Because <laughs> I've come to find out it's really not helping much like that. So just stay on your lane doing what God has called you to do. Even if it doesn't help on planet Earth, at least you can say before God, I did the little I could do. I did what you asked me to do. So what it helped, what it helps the people or not, that's another story altogether. So we got to do that. Then 
It is so our prayer language and focus will be relevant, timely, and inspired like we pray today. You can't be praying the prayers you prayed 10 years ago today. Today is a different ballgame altogether. So your prayer languages ought to be upgraded. So all of these new revelations, insights coming our way is to also help us change our prayer language or update or upgrade our prayer language. The next one is so we can be found worthy to escape. Now we've talked about visions of God and we've talked about the Holy Spirit giving way of escape. So you should begin to expect that. I, I, there is one I'm facing, ongoing, and I've been asking the Holy Spirit, and I think he gave me the answer today, this morning. You know, and it's a popular scripture that never crossed my mind when I mentioned it to my wife. So yeah, she thought about it too. So now I'm going to go back. Okay, are you saying that for this situation? Or is that general knowledge you're giving me? Is that general knowledge? Or are you saying that as applicable to this particular situation I'm dealing with? I got to go back and do that now. You have to do the same. Don't just take things for granted. Involve the Holy Spirit. Acts of the Holy Spirit. You now know he's the leader. You now know he's the commander. You now know he's in charge of operations. He's not a tag along. No, he leads the way. I know we've missed him. I don't follow what people are doing. Follow what the word of God says. There was nothing these guys did without first listening to the Holy Spirit. So we, we must do the same. Next one, it is also an indication of how we are perceived in the presence of God because, I mean, you can't deny that. It, 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 the Bible says, him whom the Lord loves, that's the one he chastises, okay? So it, God must be looking at you in a, in a certain way to even be revealing or releasing his secrets to you. And it's no strength in that his house is called the king's court. That was the revelation we received at the birthing of this house to be those who are invited to the court of the king where he deliberates on issues of the kingdom. That's, that's the vision. We want to be those who are invited to the throne realm of God so that we understand or we are, at least we are privy of deliberations concerning the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom is big. Some people are at the gate or the gates of the kingdom, right? Some people are at the outskirts of the kingdom. Yeah, but there are some who are invited to the court of the king. And so when we say we are the king's court, we are saying we are those, or we want to be those invited to the court of the king, to hear from the mouth of the king concerning the kingdom. So that's our vision, and I believe that's what's going on. But also, what I said earlier, this is our Romans 12 2 moment, our transformation moment. It says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So these new revelations are coming to renew our mind, renew our position in God. At some point, you're going to find that you're no longer conformed to the world. It's no longer what the world says, but what the Holy Spirit says. And that's my prayer. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to stand up and make these declarations. I want you to declare them loud and boldly. This, uh, we've been led through a series of prayers this morning. Those are powerful. But let's also add these. But these are going to be declarations. And we're going to say them together. You ready? All right. One to go. Oh, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. According to Isaiah 56, 7, Lord, grant that your church will indeed be a house of prayer for the nations. Activate and stir the spirit of grace or willingness for prayer and supplication according to Zechariah 12, 10. Holy Spirit, we yield to your leadership and to your charge. Activate your acts among your people. Activate your acts among us. We want you. We need you. Help us to watch as instructed by the Lord Jesus. Give us seeing eyes to see what you see. Give us hearing ears to hear what you hear. Activate the sounds of heaven. We want to hear the sounds of heaven. Activate the visions of God. We want to see the visions of God. As we watch and observe by the Spirit, may our prayers be relevant, timely, and Spirit-inspired 
Hold on. Let, let me just do this one minute. I think I know what's going on. They just give me one minute. Slide down. Okay. Okay. Some people say, okay. See, just hold on for a minute. Sorry about that. Oh, and large. Is it full zoom on your screen? <clears throat> oh, hallelujah. 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 Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. 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 Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Glory to your name, Jesus. Glory to your name, Jesus. Glory to your name, Lord. Let's, we're going to go right from the start of the prayers again. Let's do it from the start. And sorry about that to our friends um, online. <clears throat> you have the prayers, yes. All right. Okay, so let's do it one more time. One to go. <laughs> oh, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. According to Isaiah 56, 7, Lord, grant that your church will indeed be a house of prayer for the nations. Activate and stir the spirit of grace or willingness for prayer and supplication according to Zechariah 12.10. Holy Spirit, we yield to your leadership and to your charge. Activate your acts among your people. Activate your acts among us. We want you. We need you. Help us to watch as instructed by the Lord Jesus. Give us seeing eyes to see what you see. Give us hearing ears to hear what you hear. Activate the sounds of heaven. We want to hear sounds of heaven. Activate the visions of God. We want to see visions of God. As we watch and observe by the Spirit, may our prayers be relevant, timely, and Spirit-inspired. May we complete our divine assignments. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from temptation. Deliver us from snares. As we watch and observe by the Spirit, may we be in sync with divine timing. No surprises. May we see the way of escape you provide. May we not become weak, weary, unwilling, or our hearts weighed down. May we be counted worthy in your sight, O Lord, our God and our Father. May we obtain recognition in your sight, Lord Jesus. Maker of heaven and earth, we belong to you, spirit, soul, and body. You are able to keep what is entrusted to you. We commend our lives and all to you. Make your sounds known to the nations. Make your voice known to the peoples. Make your sovereignty known to world leaders, governments, and society influencers. For your glory, O oh Father, for your glory, Lord Jesus, we give you right of way, Holy Spirit, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. 
Amen and amen. Lift your hands and give him glory. Give him honor. Give him praise. Give him honor. Give him glory. Give him praise. Give him honor. Give him glory. Give him honor. Give him praise. Give him glory. Give him honor. Give him praise. Give him glory. For he deserves it. Hallelujah. 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 Glory.